Chapter Twenty One of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One American Diplomacy in England. One. The ministers and ambassadors who have represented the United States in England have an interest individually and as a body. So long a line of men, mostly distinguished, is almost a dynasty. Some of them are totally forgotten, some are remembered faintly, some have left a lasting impression. I have known a round dozen of them. The public memory is short. If I say that to Mr. Charles Francis Adams, it was permitted to do a great service to his country abroad than to any American since Franklin, or since his grandfather, John Adams, who might perhaps as a diplomatist be ranked above Franklin, if I say this, there are Americans to whom it will seem doubtful. But since Adams' greater service consisted in a just menace of war to England, if she let loose the Alexandra, the current histories written in days when every act of hostility to England was applauded, right or wrong, have done him justice. He was right, a thousand times right, and we cannot remember it too often." But what Americans ought also to remember is this, that when Mr. Adams flung his glove in Lord Russell's face, it was done neither from temper nor impulse. It was the considered act of a minister who had weighed all the chances, who had made up his mind that open war was better than covert hostility, and that it belonged to him to accept the responsibility. Whether Mr. Seward would have backed up his minister may be a question, had the minister's this means war been met by Lord Russell with then war it is. But the British government knew, even Lord Palmerston knew, they were in the wrong, and they gave way. But they gave way only because Mr. Adams had put the alternative of war before them. It was very far from being his only service or his only triumph, but it was the greatest of all. It is not too much to say that the diplomatic fortunes of the United States were in the hands of the American minister to Great Britain from 1861 to 1863, and indeed to the end of the Civil War. A weak man or an incompetent minister would have brought us to the dust. Adams, of course, was neither. He was a match for anybody in his business as minister. He had the intellectual qualities, and he had the personal qualities. Moreover, he was an Adams. He belonged to the governing classes, to one of the few great American families in whom the traditions and gifts of government are hereditary. The philosopher who divided the population of Massachusetts into men, women, and Adamses made a strictly scientific distribution. The Adamses were of that minority which under one name or another, and in all countries alike, governs. It governs none the less when it sees fit to allow the democracy to believe itself all-powerful than when it takes command as an aristocracy. I knew Mr. Adams. Mr. R. H. Dana, Jr., who smoothed so many paths for me, gave me a letter to him. This was in 1867. The days of tumult and conflict were over. His great work was done, but he remained minister till 1868. The legation was then in Portland Place. Mr. Moran was secretary of legation, an excellent official whose service in that position in London lasted 17 years and was finally rewarded by promotion to Lisbon as minister. He was a good watchdog. A secretary, of whatever rank, has to be that. Like Horatius, he has to keep the bridge, albeit against his own countrymen. They are the Volscians. When I asked to see Mr. Adams, Mr. Moran very properly wished to know why, and when I produced Mr. Dana's letter, Mr. Moran seemed to think it was addressed to him, and not till I had explained that it was Mr. Dana's, who was Mr. Adams' friend, and that I had no other business than to present this letter, did Mr. Moran's vigilance relax. We became friends afterwards. When I saw the minister, he departed a little from his official manner, greeted me kindly, and said, You have brought me a very strong letter. What can I do for you? 
when i thanked him and said i wanted nothing he relaxed a little further laughed a little and observed that most of his countrymen who called at the legation had an object he talked with a singular precision his was a mind of precision like the modern rifle equally good at short range and long if you adjust the sights but good as was his talk what impressed you most was the silent power of the man the force in reserve the solidity and the delicate temper of the metal i dwell a moment on the relations between travelling americans and their legations or embassy which to the untravelled may seem unimportant because now as much as ever and perhaps more than ever the duties of a minister of an ambassador of the embassy are so often misunderstood by that portion of the public from america which is intent on immediate admission to buckingham palace i have known many secretaries since mr moran's time they have been as a rule willing and competent really desirous to be of service to their countrymen there is no other embassy than the american on which such demands are made as on ours in london and in paris and to some extent in other capitals these demands are addressed first of all to the ambassador or ambassadress i shall take a single instance there is each year a large number of americans who desire to be presented at court and who think it the duty of the ambassador to arrange for their presentation many of these applications are sent by letter well in advance of their coming there are hundreds of such applications literally hundreds four or five hundred this year from american ladies who thought themselves and were worthy to appear before the king and queen at one of the three courts presently to be held the number of presentations which the ambassadress is entitled to make at each of the three courts is four that is a rule an ordinance of the king who has the sole authority in such matters sometimes in some special case upon reason assigned the rule is relaxed and a presentation may be made outside of it but all such requests are rigidly scrutinized and the margin is very narrow the exceptions are units in these circumstances with four hundred candidates for four presentations what is an unhappy ambassadress to do the american used to the easy ways prevailing at the white house supposes they must be equally easy at buckingham palace or that upon a word from the american ambassador in these days of pleasant anglo-american relations all doors will fly open if they do not each one of the four hundred regards hers as a case for exceptional favour she has come three thousand or four or six thousand miles in order to lend the distinction of her republican presence to these royal functions what is an ambassador for if not to give effect to these good intentions the lord chamberlain stands at the door with a drawn sword but is an american ambassador to be intimidated by a mere officer of the royal household it is in vain to answer that even a king has a right to say whom he can receive and whom he cannot le charbonneur est maître chez soi but not they think the king of england the perplexities arising out of this american eagerness to witness these royal splendours are innumerable the resentment arising out of inevitable refusals is a burden which every ambassador has to bear and every secretary too grievances are of many kinds it is not so many years since an american minister was asked by cable almost ordered by a distinguished fellow-countryman to engage lodgings for him in london it is not many more since an eminent statesman arriving after levees and drawing-rooms were over desired a secretary to arrange that he and his family should take tea with the queen at windsor palace these are cases occurring not in musical comedy but in actual life there are others relating not to royalty but to society and to various forms of english life but it is already only too evident that the diplomatic duties of an ambassador are not his only anxieties the others so far as i know anything about them have always been borne cheerfully 
Everything has been done for the American in London that could be done. He is taken care of to an extent that the Briton abroad never is, nor ever expects to be. But to all human effort there is a limit. 2. Mr. John Lothrop Motley since Mr. Adams's retirement in 1868, we have had three ambassadors whose ability as diplomatists entitles them to places in the front rank. If you take account of other kinds of ability and of ministers, there are more than three. Mr. Motley was a brilliant historian whose Rise of the Dutch Republic and History of the United Netherlands gave him a lasting European reputation and added distinction to American literature. But neither his six years of service as minister to Austria, 1861-7, to nor his year and a half in England, 1869-70, to proved him a great diplomatist. Austria was not then, and is not now, of the first importance from an American point of view. We respect her wise old emperor. We do not, I think, agree with Mr. Gladstone in saying you can nowhere put your finger on the map and say, here Austrian rule has been beneficent. She never was a model to us, and is not now. But since we like courage and clear-sighted decision and the recognition of facts and like the men who have these gifts, we have not joined very heartily in the European outcry against the Austrian annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are a world power for certain purposes only. We stand aloof from purely European complications. They are, as a rule, no affair of ours. We learned to our cost, or possibly our mortification, not very long ago, that Austria, a feat or not, was capable of giving us a lesson in diplomacy, or at least in diplomatic etiquette, by which we, or our late president, may or may not have profited. Mr. Motley, though he wrote excellent dispatches and made no diplomatic or social mistakes in that difficult Austrian capital, had not the smooth temper or the patient arts which are essential to success at critical moments. He was impetuous, explosive, rhetorical, prone to interpret his instructions in the light of his own wishes or convictions. Socially, he was a force, even in Vienna, because of his personal charm, his distinction of appearance, and of manner. Socially speaking, he was an aristocrat. He was the first American minister in London to establish himself in a house suitable to the dignity of the post, Lord Yarborough's in Arlington Street. He was known to be Count Bismarck's friend. That of itself gave him a kind of celebrity, for Count Bismarck was then a comparatively unfamiliar personage in England, where the outlook of the average man on the continental horizon was not wide. One of the first questions Count Bismarck asked me when I first talked with him in the Wilhelmstrasse in 1866 was whether I knew Motley. Yes. Are you going to Vienna? Yes. Then, of course, you will see Motley. Be sure you give him a message from me, a warm message. I have never forgotten our university days together at Gerdingen, our friendship. He knows that, but tell him again, and tell him I hope to see him in Berlin before he goes home. As he spoke, there came into the eyes of the Iron Chancellor a look I had not seen before. The steel blue softened into the blue of the skies after rain, as the Chinese say. His friendship for Motley was an affectionate friendship. Later, I talked with Motley about Bismarck, and, of course, delivered my message. Yes, said Motley, we were boys together at Gerdingen. His was a different life from mine. I dare say you have heard the stories about young Bismarck's exploits. In those matters, he was like most students of his time and of his class. The Prussian Junker is a being by himself but we became friends, and friends we have remained. We don't often meet, but the friendship has never died or decayed. Another thing made Motley far otherwise popular in England, his passionate Americanism. Mr. Price Collier is of opinion that Englishmen do not like Americans. I do not agree with Mr. Collier, but whether they do or not, they like an American to be an American. 
they liked mr motley because his patriotism burst forth in all companies and at all times it made him or tended to make him reluctant to compromise on any question where the interests of his country were concerned but compromise is of the essence of diplomacy most of all as between the greatest powers of the world if nobody ever yielded anything negotiations could end only in surrender or in war the two things which it is the business of diplomacy to avoid nothing motley ever did in diplomacy was of such service to his country as his two letters to the times early in the civil war and his memorable outburst in the athenaeum club to write the letters he violated the unwritten law of diplomacy for he was then minister to austria to make the athenaeum speech for it was nothing less he departed from the other unwritten law which makes a club neutral ground and makes anything like an oration impossible but motley had among other qualities the quality of courage his invective in the Athenaeum against the very classes among whose representatives he stood was magnificent, and it came very near being war or a declaration of war. He would keep no terms with the men who were enemies of his country in such a crisis as that. If it had been anybody but Motley who thundered against the ignorance and prejudice of the Confederate allies who then gave the tone to English society, I imagine the committee of the club might have taken notice. But Motley fascinated while he rebuked. When he had done denouncing them as renegades to English ideas and enemies to liberty, they liked him the better. I can think of no incident so like this as Plimsoll's defiance of the House of Commons, when he rushed into the middle of the floor and charged his fellow members with sacrificing the lives of English sailors to the cupidity of English shipowners, and so compelled the House to adopt the load line. History has taken note of Plimsoll's exploit. Motley's may never appear in pages which aim at historical dignity, but to this day, when near half a century has passed, motley's is still remembered still spoken of still admired there are men living who heard him the english do not entirely like being reminded of their mistakes about us at that period but they bear no malice against the man whose admonition did much to bring them to their senses on the contrary through all these forty odd years you might have heard motley spoken of with admiring good will before all things he loved his own country Next to his own country, Rongo Intervallo, he loved England, and it may be doubted whether we have ever sent a minister, or anybody else, to England, whom the English themselves have loved as they loved Motley. His deep blue eyes shine star-like across all that interval of years. He carried his head high. His stature was well above the usual stature of men. In all companies he was conspicuous for beauty and for his bearing and from the confusion and forgetfulness of that crowded period he still emerges a living force a brilliant memory an american as dean stanley said of him in whom the aspirations of america and the ancient culture of europe were united there is supposed to be still a mystery about his recall by president grant but it is an open-air mystery grant struck at sumner through motley any weapon was thought good enough to beat Sumner with. Motley was his friend. Sumner had made him minister. It was deemed possible to humiliate Sumner and to teach him a lesson. The interests of the country were not allowed to stand in the way of this high purpose, and so Motley went. Or rather, he did not go. Asked to resign in July 1870, he disregarded that request grant hesitated or perhaps mr fish then secretary of state hesitated but in november of the same year motley was recalled an act without precedent and happily never repeated no charges were made there were none to make motley's diplomatic record his personal character were spotless 
the childish scandal started at vienna never had a rag of evidence to support it nor anything behind it but anonymous personal animosity his departure from england left no stain upon anybody except upon president grant and upon such officers and ministers of his as stooped to be the instruments of his ill will three two ministers and two ambassadors mr lowell may be compared with mr motley as an example of our american method of appointing ministers who not only are not for they could not be trained diplomats but whose character is essentially undiplomatic mr motley was however so much more a man of the world than mr lowell that they cannot be bracketed there is a similarity but no identity until lowell came to london he was a recluse motley had never been that lowell had been a professor in harvard university motley though a student and historian was not what the english call donnish whereas lowell had often the air of lecturing the company as if a company of pupils delightful as his talk was the touch of the pedagogue was there indeed it may be doubted whether life in a university which is a world by itself is ever a good training for diplomacy an ambassador ought to be a man of the world it is perhaps the first and highest of his qualifications but not a man of a world a thorough knowledge of the greek aorist or of the proceedings of antigonus in asia minor is not needed in the conduct of delicate negotiations nor did lowell find his familiarity with spanish literature of much use at the foreign office or in that larger foreign office known as english society society was to lowell in the beginning of his english experiences a stumbling block and to the end he only too often made a misstep he was liked all the same the english are a people who can make allowances nor do they expect a non-englishman to be cast in an english mould they recognized his positive merits they did not dwell on what they thought defects i suppose i have before now told what i have always thought a characteristic saying of an english host as lowell drove away from his door i need not tell you how much i like lowell or how delighted i am to have him here as often as he will come but from the moment he enters my house till he is gone i am in a panic the panic into which this genial host fell was due to lowell's fighting spirit surely not the spirit of a diplomatist to that and to a passion for accuracy which he allowed to become pedantic and aggressive he left behind him a path strewn with victims a renown for brilliancy a just repute for many amiable and delightful traits but the qualities essential to a minister were not among them mr e j phelps who came after him was a lawyer and a lawyer may perhaps be expected to be more combative than a professor but it was not so mr phelps took mr lowell's house in lowndes square a respectable dwelling in a very good square but by no means an ideal legation when mr phelps became his tenant the atmosphere changed the climate was a softer climate the amelioration was due in part to mrs phelps who was beloved mrs lowell had been an invalid her husband used to say my wife has no acquaintance and i have no invention as an excuse for social shortcomings but mrs phelps knew a great many people and charmed those whom she knew it is doubtful whether an abler man than mr phelps ever came from the united states to london as minister he was hailed at once as a brother by his brethren of the bar and they put him on a level with their best his simplicity of character his humour his truthfulness were evident to everybody intellectually he was anybody's equal as minister he had like all his predecessors his trade to learn but he soon learned what was essential learned diplomacy as if it were a new cause he had to master for a great trial his mind was judicial he ought to have been chief justice of the supreme court of the united states with the promise of a nomination to that great post in his pocket he went home but he returned the will of mr pat collins of boston 
hating Phelps because he would not, as minister, be the instrument of Irish ill-will to England, have proved stronger than the will or the word of the President. Mr. Cleveland's surrender, no doubt under strong political pressure, deprived us of Mr. Phelps' services as Chief Justice, and he became a law lecturer at Yale. He was a jurist who would have adorned either place. He was also an orator who leaped into fame by a single speech, at the farewell dinner given him in London, although indeed his speech at a dinner of welcome on his arrival was scarcely less felicitous a masterpiece of oratory dignified eloquent and pathetic said lord rosebery a judge of oratory if there be one we have sent to england so many different kinds of ministers and ambassadors that they must be praised and happily most of them can be praised with discrimination and also with brevity for i cannot go on for ever writing on a single topic i pass to mr hay the mansion Mr. Hay leased in Carlton House Terrace was, like all those on the south side of that short street looking on St. James Park, adequate and even imposing. It was like unto the larger one on the corner, formerly Lord Ardillon's, now Lord Ridley's. When Mr. Blaine entered it one evening at a concert, he said to the friend who was with him, This is the first really palatial house to which you brought me not a palace but palatial mr hay knew as well as any american then living or better what a part social influences could be made to play in diplomatic life he played that part with distinction he was born for it he had cultivated his natural gifts in half a dozen european capitals he had such a knowledge of england and the english people that it has always seemed a pity he did not write a book about them but he left a record as ambassador which tells the story he was a man who carried his point without a collision he loved england and was beloved when president mckinley sent for him to come home and be secretary of state hay said i am a soldier and must obey orders but all my fun in life is over as it turned out it was not over a still greater career opened before him and he was the first american secretary of state to make an imaginative use of his opportunities and a great name in europe and asia alike he was the first american secretary of state to take the lead in a world embracing policy to unite the european powers in support of it to extract a binding pledge even from russia to bring japan not very willingly into this charmed circle and to lay the foundations of american influence in china broad and deep we often talk of america as a world power we have a right to, and whatever be the more recent, and perhaps in some cases rather doubtful, extension of our authority, we owe what is best and most lasting in our position abroad to Hay. None of all this could Hay foresee when he quitted London for Washington. What he knew was that he was relinquishing a place for which he had proved his fitness, and embarking upon the unknown this sorrow at leaving england was genuine and the sorrow of his english friends and if ever there be such a thing as a general sorrow of the english public was not less the late queen said of hay he is the most interesting of all the ambassadors i have known if the authority for this is wanted it was said by the queen to lord pauncefoot then british ambassador to the united states and Lord Pauncefoot repeated it to me, with leave to repeat it to others, as I now do, by no means for the first time. To Mr. Hay succeeded Mr. Shote. I hope it will be taken as a compliment if I say Mr. Shote was better liked the longer he stayed. He had, when he arrived, a frankness of speech which is sometimes called American, and is, no doubt, characteristic of certain individual Americans, there is in mr henry james bostonians an american banker settled in england to whom his son provoked by a remark of the father to a noble lord who was his guest observes well father you have lived here a long time and you have learned some of the things they say but you haven't learnt the things they don't say it is inevitable in new social circumstances time is of the essence 
It is no reproach to Mr. Choate that he found it so. He had and has an exuberant wit, one somewhat contemptuous of conventions and established forms. He poured it out in floods. He gave free scope to its caprices. When it had become chastened by experience, the English delighted in it, as we Americans have long delighted in it. But time was needed on both sides. The English and Mr. Choate had to become accustomed to each other. In the end, they did. A beautiful harmony grew up, and before Mr. Choate went home, he was an accepted figure in the society which at first had sometimes a questioning spirit. He, too, lived as an ambassador ought to live, and in Carlton House Terrace, like Mr. Hay. From the beginning, the Foreign Office had found in him, in Bismarck's phrase, a man with whom it was possible to do business, for he had a kind of preternatural rapidity in mastering great affairs, and a marked skill in the composition of public addresses. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Two Unaccredited Ambassadors. They were both from Boston in the days when they first became known in England and began their work of conciliation as between England and the United States. Boston was still Boston, and New York had only begun to be New York. The latter statement may be challenged, but the very men who take most pride in the New York of today ought to be the first to accept it. For Manhattan was not then the magnet, as London has always been, which drew to itself whatever was best from other parts of the land. Boston was still the Athens of America. There were excellent names elsewhere, and at least one man of genius who owed neither birth nor culture to Boston. But the capital of Massachusetts was nonetheless the literary capital of the United States. Emerson, Holmes, Lowell, Longfellow, Agassiz, R. H. Dana, Jr., were all living and all in the fullness of their powers. Theodore Parker, the greatest force in the American pulpit, was just dead. Chief Justice Shaw had been for thirty years the head of the judiciary of his own state and a revered authority throughout the Union. Wendell Phillips had no rival as an orator. Harvard was the first of American colleges. The ideas of New England, which were the ideas of Boston, had spread and taken root, and new commonwealths in the West were nourished on them. Nay, these ideas and these conceptions of law and social order were the foundation stones on which new states were built. No theologian had arisen to dim the fame, a great yet somber fame, of Jonathan Edwards. Daniel Webster, disappointed, defeated, slept by the solemn waves of the Atlantic, but you cannot think of Boston or of Massachusetts without him, nor did the disasters of his last years much lessen the homage paid him at death or his immense influence on the political thought of the whole country. If the intellectual preeminence of Boston in those days was somewhat grudgingly admitted by New York, it was incontestable. New York presently redressed the balance, not so much by her own creative efforts as by drawing much of what there was best in Boston to the banks of the Hudson. I believe Mr. Howell's migration at a later period was thought to be the decisive sign, one of many. Commercial influences prevailed over the purer influences of literature. The publisher took command but I apprehend that Mr. Howells did not forsake the Charles for the Hudson without many regrets. The atmosphere was not the same. Old Abernethy used to say, If you live in the best air in the world, leave it and go to the second best. Unconsciously, perhaps, Mr. Howells obeyed that medical prescription. He went to the second best. Did he find a tavern club in New York? Over the noctes coenque of that pleasant company in Boston, Mr. Howells used to preside, with a genial charm all his own. It was so long ago that I may be forgiven if I remember in print one of those evenings which owed so much to his presiding genius. 
he spoke and was the cause of speaking in others he had the tact which drew from others more than they supposed they had to give he gently compelled the most reluctant of guests from their chairs there was a brief eulogy on the victim it was mr howell's art to paint a portrait so vivid albeit flattering it needed no name to be recognized if said he you were in any doubt of his identity you will recognize him by the look of determined unconsciousness on his face I reckon it among the highest of Mr. Howell's many services that he has been at times an interpreter between England and America, and in more senses than one. There is a sense in which every American writer who reaches an English audience is an interpreter, or better still, an ambassador, the business of an ambassador being to keep the peace. For when Lord Dufferin was complimented on his diplomatic fame, he answered ah that is all a mistake so long as we succeed you never hear of us it is when we have failed that the world begins to know of our existence that however is a malapropos anecdote and tells the other way but in such papers as these there must be anecdotes mr howells was not a silent ambassador and he would not have been an ambassador had he been silent his books spoke for him the english thought and still think that his writings had some qualities which it does not suit the parent stock to consider distinctively american they liked the reserve the simplicity the continual though implicit reference to english literature it was partly because of the homage he paid to the great masters that they presently came to accept him also as a master they were quite aware that his homage was sometimes reluctant when it went further and as in his unlucky criticism of the greatest of english masters in fiction became a caricature they resented it but they bore no malice how can you bear malice against a writer with so much sweetness of nature as mr howells besides what he has written about england is sympathetic and is thought sympathetic by the english if it be also at times critical the english accept the criticism as it is meant nothing is truer about them than their indifference to criticism they regard mr howells's essays as so many studies and these studies as interpretive what he has lately been writing of provincial towns is almost a revelation to the londoner who himself is sometimes called provincial and does not mind another bostonian mr henry james took a longer flight still all the way from boston to london and so to paris and italy in all of which he is equally at home it was i think colonel higginson who in his patriotic impatience of the expatriated american winged a shaft at mr james and at those who called him cosmopolitan in order to be truly cosmopolitan said this eminent colonel a man ought to know something of his own country to which mr james has lately made the best possible reply by a book on his own country which is an appreciation like no other of recent days and i will say this that if colonel higginson supposes an american or a russian or a japanese can win favor with the english by trying to be english he is profoundly mistaken the english like an american to be an american if he is a writer they like his writings to be american who are the american authors most popular in england i will take the dead only they are hawthorne emerson lowell longfellow holmes dana and walt whitman others perhaps but if there are others they are all like these i have named american to the fingertips american in thought in language in method nay if you like in accent that is why they are relished in england i do not include poe he is better understood in france than in england his genius is perhaps more gallic than saxon so much so that when the american ambassador delivered a discourse at the celebration in london of poe's centennial it was as if he had spoken on a topic remote from the minds of this english people they read him because he was an american ambassador or because he was mr whitlaw reed and for his graceful mastery of the topic and of the english language 
but to them he seemed to be announcing a discovery. When Mr. Henry James adopted his new manner, the manner in which all his books since the awkward age have been produced, his English readers turned away from him, or many of them did. The change coincided, or nearly so, with his change from pen and ink to dictation, a perilous experiment. But whatever else may be said of it, Mr. James has gradually won back his English public. To them, the matter is more than the manner, as in Mr. Meredith's case also. The American is now thought a more distinguished writer than before. I use the word distinguished as he uses it, meaning that he has more distinction as a writer and turns out more distinguished work. They are no longer repelled by his colloquialisms, by his gallicisms, by his obscurities, by his involutions of structure, or by the labyrinthine length of his sentences. Through all these, they now perceive, pierces the true genius of the man. Therefore is he another ambassador, another of those Americans who, from having become known abroad, have added luster to the fame of their own country, where, in European estimation, it most needs luster, namely, in the domain of letters. By the time the New Yorker of today has read thus far, if he has read, it may have become clear to him how great a part of all the renown in literature we have abroad comes to us from Boston. All the American writers best known here, and most read, Whitman excepted, are of Boston, or of the state in which Boston is, or was, the final expression. If another exception were to be made, it would be Lincoln, whose greatest pieces of prose, and most of all the Gettysburg Address, are well known to Englishmen who know anything of America. If what Dr. Johnson said in the preface to his dictionary, the chief glory of every people arises from its authors, be true, then what do we Americans not owe to Boston? Supposing, that is, we care for the judgment of a foreign nation, which Browning declared to be like the judgment of posterity. For some of these Bostonians, London has a personal affection. Emerson is beloved, Lowell was an immense favorite, a favorite notwithstanding his combativeness in a society which prefers toleration to excursions on the warpath. Holmes, during his visits here, was idolized, and as the autocrat of the breakfast table, he is idolized, and quoted day in and day out. Of Longfellow's poems in the pre-copyright days, more copies were sold than of Tennyson, and when he was here, the English thought him almost one of themselves. Dana's Two Years Before the Mast is the one story of the sea which among many rivals seems likely to be immortal in England, and is, meantime, the one which in circulation year after year far exceeds all others and Dana was one of those Americans on whom the English found an English birthmark. There was a time when Mr. James and Mr. Howells used to be bracketed as if they hunted in couples, which was not a discriminating view, though a popular view. It expressed itself in the jingle about Howells and James' young men, of which the music hall was the proper home and there it related to a firm in Regent Street, now extinct. But it was sung by the daughters of a house where Mr. James was a guest, and almost in his hearing, to the horror of its mistress. To all popularity there are penalties, but the popularity of Mr. James is perennial. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. Some Account of a Revolution in International Journalism. 1. Returning to New York in the early autumn of 1866 and spending the winter in the Tribune office, I was again sent abroad the following year, this time under an agreement to remain till 1870. 
i was to go as the exponent of a new theory of american journalism in europe a theory based on the belief that the cable had altered all the conditions of international news gathering and that a new system had to be created i had been long enough in london and on the continent to be convinced that london must become the distributing centre of european news for america i talked it over with mr young on my return mr young had a mind open to new ideas and he was unusually quick in deciding but this suggestion struck him at first as a proposal to impair the authority of the managing editorship he thought naturally there ought to be but one executive head and that a european manager no matter how strictly subordinated to his chief in new york would at such a distance acquire too much independence the proposal moreover was far-reaching and had no precedent not that the want of a precedent troubled mr young much he had spent much of his time as managing editor of the tribune in disregarding precedents and laying down laws of his own but this scheme he presently saw would never have been thought of had not submarine telegraphy taken a practicable shape nor would such a scheme have been of much practical use so long as news went by mail nor could it be tried till a great many details had been thought out under the old system each tribune correspondent reported directly to new york had that system remained unaltered the triumph of american journalism in europe would have been impossible that all the european representatives of this paper should report to london instead of new york might seem no very great matter but in truth it was vital when it had once been decided to establish a tribune office in london a revolution had taken place there was to be a responsible agent in charge he was to organize a new administration he was to appoint and dismiss other agents all over the continent he was subject of course to orders from new york to transmit news to new york he was to be the telephone between europe and the managing editor in new york but he was to relieve the new york office of its supervision over the european staff what st petersburg and vienna berlin and paris had to say to new york was to be said through london there would be an economy of time orders could be sent from london and results received much more quickly than from new york in an emergency as was presently to be shown the difference was enormous the notion of the centrality of london of its unity as a news bureau was perfectly simple but it took years for that one simple notion to get itself completely accepted and acted upon i will give one illustration when the fatal days of july eighteen seventy were upon us i thought i saw a great opportunity the tribune alone had an organization in europe competent for the work of supplying war news but as i did not know how much news new york wanted i cabled a question to the editor then temporarily in charge the answer came back that i was to go to berlin it would have been a fatal step i should have come under german military rule and cabling from berlin at that time and much later was a slow and uncertain business nor could the plans i had in mind have been carried out from berlin there would have been a censorship upon every dispatch and censorship means not merely mutilation to soothe a bureaucratic ideal but delay berlin moreover was remote while london is on the road to new york and spite of the cable the delay from that cause also would have been injurious in short i disobeyed the new york order i explained of course but i pointed out that an unfettered discretion was essential to success and i asked to be allowed a free hand or to be relieved i was given the free hand these methods have since become so familiar that there is little need to explain them but at that time they were not merely novel but were derided by journalists of great experience mr james gordon bennett was one of those who scoffed at them and presently was one of those who followed them and made a large use of them greatly to his own profit and to that of the considerable news organization he controlled but at first he said nothing would induce him to set up in london a rival office to new york 
now every important journal in the united states has offices in london and subsidiary offices in paris and often in other european capitals but the authority of new york or chicago remains what it was the idea once accepted somebody had then to be appointed to london mr young asked me to go i declined i liked leader writing much better than news collecting i thought the power of influencing opinion through the editorial columns of the tribune the most enviable of all powers the london scheme moreover was an experiment and i did not think i had had enough experience with news to justify my undertaking so large a business but mr young pressed it saying it was my scheme and i ought to put it in operation he might had he chosen have issued an order and i should have had no choice but to obey or resign but that was not his way he trusted to persuasion he treated his subordinates as for some purposes his equals and he did not care for unwilling service he was a past master in the art of stating a case and in the use of personal influence in the end he convinced me and not only that i ought to go but that i wanted to go and i gave in still with misgivings but not without a certain enthusiasm at the prospect of doing a new thing in journalism it was like young to say as he did at parting remember i don't care about methods you will use your own methods what i want is results the incredulity with which the tribune experiment was first received gave way slowly but it gave way i suppose it was the new service of the tribune in the franco-german war in eighteen seventy which finally convinced the most sceptical so i will pass to that stopping only to explain one other matter it was in eighteen seventy also that the first international newspaper alliance was formed the papers which formed it were the tribune of new york and the daily news of london i saw at the beginning that it was desirable to be in a position to know what news would go to new york through reuter and the associated press that knowledge was only to be had inside of a london newspaper office and it was with that view chiefly that i first made a proposal to the daily news i suppose i chose that paper because i knew its editor and manager i did not think it likely that the daily news service from the battlefield would at first add much to our own nor did it but i went to mr afterward sir john robinson with an offer to exchange news whether by telegraph or mail on equal terms we to give them everything we had and they to do the like by us the offer was very coldly received mr robinson could see no advantage to his paper from such an agreement i told him what we were doing and intending to do still he was incredulous and he finally said no i told him i did not mean that either paper should narrow its operations at the seat of war in expectation of help from the other nor that either should credit the other with its news it was to be a war partnership and each would put all its forces in the field but he would not have it it was mr frank hill then editor of the daily news who came to the rescue the news department was none of his but he had an all-embracing intelligence and when he heard what the offer was he pressed it upon his colleague and finally secured its acceptance the credit for whatever benefit inured to the daily news from this partnership was therefore due originally to mr frank hill and not to mr robinson it remains true that mr robinson was a very distinguished journalist and that his work at a later period of the war was of a high order if he had done nothing but secure the services of mr archibald forbes he would have earned a lasting renown as manager but before forbes's work had begun to tell the daily news receiving and publishing the tribune dispatches as its own as it had an absolute right to do under our agreement had won a great reputation for its war news sir john robinson is dead but i published a statement on this subject while he was living which was brought to his attention i said then as i say now that the daily news owed to the tribune almost the whole of the war news by which its reputation was at first acquired this period lasted down to the surrender of metz perhaps later 
my statement was never disputed it may still be found in harper's magazine where the facts are set forth much more fully than here and it was this article in harper's which sir john robinson read we had ceased to be on good terms i forget why he grumbled a little at the publication of the story though without reason but he attempted no denial and no denial was possible the matter was much discussed at the time in the american press and there were many criticisms based on an absolute ignorance of the real arrangement between the two papers further confusion grew out of the fact that one of the tribune's war correspondents had a contract with the pell mell gazette then owned by mr george smith and edited by mr frederick greenwood one of the great journalists of his time this contract left him free to deal with us but not with any london paper it followed therefore that some of the tribune dispatches appeared in the daily news and some in the pell mell gazette our new york friends could not understand this tripartite agreement but then it was not necessary they should and our comments were much more amusing than they would have been if they had known the truth the mind moves with great freedom when unhampered by facts two american methods said certain english journalists seeking to account for the tribune's successes in the franco-german war the phrase whether meant as eulogy or criticism was at any rate explanatory for we had had four years of civil war experience from eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five while the english unless we reckon the indian mutiny had to go back to the crimean war in eighteen fifty four for precedence in war correspondence moreover the one great triumph of english journalism in the crimea was not a triumph of method it was a triumph due to the genius and courage of one man dr russell who exposed through the times the murderous mistakes of army organization and army administration and so forced the war office and the horse guards to set their houses in order it was a great public service perhaps the greatest which any journalist in the field ever performed but it was not exactly journalism it had little or nothing to do with that speed and accuracy in the collection and transmission of news which after all must be the chief business of a correspondent it has never been imitated it never will be until another russell appears to rescue another british army in another crimea that great exploit was not primarily journalistic but personal i do not suppose it occurred to any of the many able newspaper managers in london that in dealing with a european war they would find a rival in an american journal they knew there was an atlantic cable but probably thought if they thought about it at all that the cable tolls would be prohibitive for as we shall see in a moment they had not yet grasped the idea that the telegraph is only a quicker post putting the question of cost aside it does not matter how a piece of news or a dispatch or a letter is transmitted whether by rail or by steamship or by wire what matters is that it should get there today this is a truism forty years ago it was a paradox in europe if not in america there have been great achievements in the transmission of news long before the telegraph was invented it may be doubted whether they were not some of them greater than those due to the telegraph but so far as the use of the telegraph is concerned we are dealing with the beginnings the year eighteen seventy is a year of transition if not of revolution i think we are entitled to remember with satisfaction that in telegraphic news enterprise even in europe it was an american journal which led the way and that the tribune was that journal in forming their war plans the managers of english journals as i was saying left american journals out of account perhaps they knew in a dim kind of way that the tribune had an office in london but the office had been there for three years and no other american journal had yet followed the tribune's example important dispatches had been sent from this london office to the new york office by cable but the london managers if aware of the existence of the cable and of the tribune office in london had not coordinated these two pieces of knowledge 
the area of all possible competition in war was news confined in their view to the fleet street and printing house square they sat content true britons as they were in their belief in their own supremacy a supremacy often challenged never overthrown the times was still the times the morning post was still a threepenny paper the daily telegraph was still the organ of the small shopkeeper the daily news was the mouthpiece of nonconformist liberalism with no great pretensions to any other sort of authority the evening journalism was not supposed to be eager for news except news of that peculiar description which offers its readers an afternoon sensation and is unaccountably omitted from the next morning's papers the news journalism was yet to be born the daily mail had never been heard of lord norcliffe the man who has done more than all others of his time toward the creation of a new journalism in england and who is almost more a statesman than a journalist was then just two years old moreover the outbreak of war was unexpected lord granville was then foreign secretary and of an unshaken optimism lord hammond permanent under-secretary of the foreign office had announced a fortnight before that never since had he held a place in that office had the sky been so free from clouds monsieur emile olivier has lately retold with skill in the revue des deux mondes how the war was brought on but there is nothing in his elaborate special pleading to show that any reasonable man ought to have expected the french emperor or even m olivier himself to follow the unreasonable mad arrogant policy they did follow nor can downing street or fleet street or printing-house square be blamed for not being aware that the conduct of affairs in france was in the control of men who would play into bismarck's hands for let m olivier say what he will bismarck's opportunity would not have come had not france after prussia had withdrawn prince leopold's candidature for the throne of spain demanded a guarantee that it should never be renewed or never be supported by prussia never had events moved so quickly prince leopold was first heard of july fourth eighteen seventy on the twelfth he renounced his claim on the thirteenth benedetti laid before the king of prussia at ems the demand of france for guarantees on the fourteenth earl granville woke from his deep dream of peace and strove to bring france and prussia to terms on the fifteenth the emperor declared war the chamber approving by an overwhelming majority there are in journalism two ways of dealing with a war crisis of this kind one way is to send into the field everybody you can lay hands on to cover tant bien que mal as many points as possible and so take your chance of what may turn up the other is to choose the two best men available and send one to the headquarters of each army i preferred the latter perhaps because there was a difficulty in finding good men and there were but two from whom i expected much good these were mr holt white an englishman and m Maisonal, a frenchman mr white was ordered to join the prussians and mr Maisonal to accompany his own countrymen the same instructions were given to both very simple but i believe at that time quite novel in england each was to find his way to the front or wherever a battle was most likely to be fought they were to telegraph to london as fully as possible all accounts of preliminary engagements if they had the good luck to witness an important battle they were not to telegraph but unless for some very peremptory reason to start at once for london writing their accounts on the way or on arrival if they could telegraph a summary first so much the better but there must be no delay the essential thing was to arrive in london at the earliest moment they were to provide beforehand for a substitute or more than one who would take up their work during their absence these instructions were based on the improbability that any single correspondent could anticipate any very important news which governments the news agencies and the rothschilds would all three endeavour to send first 
i reversed the order in which a minister once said to me news of war or of high politics usually arrived such news he said comes to the rothschilds first next to the press and to the government last of all besides the mere fact never contents the public it wants the full story there was never much chance of sending the full story by wire from the battlefield or from any town hard by nor indeed from any capital even from a neutral capital only when once in london was a correspondent master of the situation mr holt white carried out his instructions with an energy a courage and intelligence to which no tribute can be too high in the first instance he witnessed the battle not an important one except that it was the first of spicheren and wired a column or so to london it was i believe the first battle story of any length ever sent by wire from the continent to london english journalism as i said above had not yet regarded the telegraph as anything but a means of transmitting results the full account was to come by mail i had told mr robinson i meant to use the telegraph in this new way but he was not ready to believe it could be done so when i carried mr white's account to the daily news office after cabling a rewritten copy to new york i took with me the original telegraph forms as well as the second copy the dispatch as telegraphed by mr white was slightly condensed had been carelessly handled and was not in good shape for the printers i handed my copy to mr robinson he looked at it with undisguised suspicion it is your handwriting he said i admitted that and the battle was fought only yesterday yes it could not have come by post no well then how by wire a dispatch of that length it is unheard of but i thought this had gone far enough and showed him the telegraph forms still he said do you expect me to print this to-morrow in the daily news print it or not as you choose it will certainly appear in the tribune i have done as i agreed in bringing you the dispatch you of course will do as you think best about publishing it i repeat this because it indicates better than i could otherwise the journalistic state of mind at that time in respect of continental telegrams mr robinson was at the head of his profession yet this was his reception of this piece of news in the end mr frank hill the editor was called into consultation he had no hesitation and as before finally brought his colleague to reason the telegram duly appeared next morning in the daily news heralded by a leading article in which the telegram was rewritten its importance pointed out the celerity of its dispatch and arrival dwelt on and so the readers of the daily news had every opportunity to admire the enterprise of that journal this was very far from being mr holt white's most brilliant exploit but it was his first he had not the luck to see the battle of worth the earliest of the grave disasters of the french no journalist had that great engagement and the defeat of marshal mcmahon were foreseen by nobody the germans themselves excepted and there exists no account of the battle in the newspapers of the day save such as came by hearsay or much later the official reports but when the bare facts were known they were thought prophetic and the military critics of pall mall and whitehall said gravely this is the beginning of the end End of chapter 23Chapter 24 of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24, Holt White's Story of Sedan and How It Reached the New York Tribune. I pass over the interval between Worth and Sedan, crowded as it was with events, stopping only to remark that the Tribune was indebted to an American writer on the Daily News for its account of Gravelotte but not to the daily news except for the opportunity of buying that account at a high price there was an entangling alliance which forbade the daily news to hand it over to the tribune but did not prevent the correspondent of that paper from selling it 
I am not sure whether the name of the writer is known, but in the circumstances it is not for me to disclose it. The narrative was, of course, cabled to the Tribune at once. Gravelotte was fought on the 18th of August. The account of the battle reached New York, I think, on the 21st. It was, at any rate, the first and for some time the only narrative published. The defeated French called it the Battle of Raisonville, and under that name was this description first printed. From a military point of view, the account had no great value, but it was picturesquely written, and in those difficult days anything from the field was eagerly read. Greater days were at hand. The Battle of Sedan was fought on Thursday, September 1st, 1870, followed by the surrender of the town, the army, and the Emperor Napoleon on the day following. The news of the catastrophe was not known in London till Saturday morning at ten o'clock, and then only in the briefest form, the mere fact and not much more, through the general press agency, I suppose, Reuters. Mr. Robinson wired me, and I went to the Daily News office, but the bare news was of no great use for my purposes. I went back to the Tribune office in Pell-Mell, wondering what I was to do, and still more what the Tribune correspondent in the field were doing. I had not long to wait. A dispatch arrived from Mr. Holt White, saying he should be in London that afternoon, and at five o'clock he walked into the office. Seldom have I been so glad to see any man's face as I was to see his, but there was hardly so much as a greeting between us. I asked first, Is your dispatch ready? Not a word of it is written. Will you sit down at once and begin? I cannot. I am dead tired, and have had no food since daybreak. I must eat and sleep before I can write. He looked it, a mere wreck of a correspondent haggard ragged dirty incapable of the effort which nevertheless had to be made it was no time to consider anybody's feelings a continent was waiting for the news locked up in that man's brain and somehow or other the lock must be forced the news told and the waiting continent supplied with what it wanted incidentally it was such an opportunity for the tribune as seldom had come to any newspaper it was necessary to use a little authority i said to mr holt white you shall have something to eat but sleep you cannot till you have done your dispatch that must be in new york to-morrow morning so we went over to the pell-mell restaurant which was then in the building now replaced by the oceanic house the headquarters of the international marine navigation company if that be its name food and drink refreshed him we were back in the tribune office not long after six and work began mr holt white wrote one of the worst hands ever seen so i said to him i would copy as he wrote and my copy would go to the cable operators bad or good mine was a hand they were familiar with we sat opposite each other at the same table and i copied sheet by sheet till there was enough to give the cable a start and then took it to the anglo-american cable office in telegraph street i went myself for two reasons first to make sure it was delivered and second to make sure it went without interruption the latter indeed was a point of which it was impossible under the weaver regime to make sure but i could at least hand in the message over the counter many a message have i trusted myself and nobody else with and many a letter have i posted with my own hands everything in fact of importance ever since i had anything to do with journalism it is often inconvenient but i have found it a good rule i dwell on these details few things in american journalism the civil war excepted have made more stir than this exploit of mr holt white but the full credit which belongs to him he has never had consider what he had done he had been all through the battle he had been in the saddle all day from four o'clock in the morning till nightfall the battle over he started for london he rode with his life in his hand he had to pass the lines of three armies the prussians who refused him a permit the french outposts to the north of sedan and the belgians who made a pretense of guarding their frontier and the neutrality of belgian territory he could not explain how he managed it 
when he reached brussels he thought it might be possible to write there and to wire his account from brussels to london but at the chief telegraph office in brussels the official in charge told him flatly that he would accept no dispatch relating to the war the issue of the battle was unknown in brussels anything handed in for transmission to london or elsewhere would be submitted first of all to the censor and in brussels as elsewhere the censorship is a heart-rending business delay inevitable and there was no time for delay it was as i explained in an earlier chapter one reason why all correspondents were directed to come straight to london where the censorship did not exist mr holt white was soon satisfied that it was useless to try to telegraph from brussels and he came on by train to calais missed the calais boat caught a later one which did not connect with the dover london service and once at dover chartered a special train to london and so at last arrived i asked him if any other correspondent had come with him he thought not at any rate no one whom he knew as correspondent and of course no one came by the special train still there was no certainty it was already two days since the sun had gone down on the beaten french in sedan there was nothing to do except to hurry on the dispatch to new york with indomitable courage white rode on after a time i asked him if he would rest a little before finishing no he said if i stop i shall go to sleep and if i go to sleep i shall not wake the man's pluck was a splendid thing to see his answer was like the answer of an atlantic captain who in the old days when there was no telephone and designers had not learned how to make the captain's cabin the nerve centre of the ship had been for three days and nights on the bridge i asked him how he lived through it he said it was rather trying to the knees but did you ever sit down? Oh, if I had sat down, I should have gone to sleep. There are heroisms of that kind in the routine of life, professional and other, and even in the profession of journalism, of which the newspaper reader in the morning over his coffee and rolls never thinks. But they are real, and without them, and without the loyalty and devotion of such men, there might sometimes be nothing for the man with his coffee and rolls to read." white sat at his table till midnight and later it was nearer two o'clock than one before the last of his message was filed in telegraph street whether by mr weaver's intervention or not i cannot say but there was a delay on the wires the delay i was afterwards told was on the newfoundland land lines to new york it may be so it was a message six columns long and not all of it appeared in the tribune that next sunday morning though all of it had been filed in ample time two o'clock in the morning in london being only nine o'clock in the evening before in new york no matter it was clear coherent vivid battle story and it was the only one no morning paper in london had any account of the battle till the tuesday following and all new york accounts the tribune accepted were from the london press or press agencies it is not worth while to recall the comments of the tribune's rivals they were angry naturally enough and they resorted to conjectures which might as well have been left unexpressed it is enough to explain further that mr holt white's narrative did not appear in the daily news because he had an agreement with the pell mell gazette part of this account therefore was printed in an abridged form in the pell mell of monday for which it was written separately the pell mell is an evening paper and when that was cabled to new york and found to be obviously from the same source as the tribunes the guesses grew wild but the plain truth is now told and is simple enough Mr. Holt White was a journalist, but not at that time a journalist of any exceptional reputation or position. This, I think, was the first very considerable thing he had done. I am sorry to have to add that it was also the last. He was a man to whom, after such an achievement as this, a long repose became necessary. He rejoined the Prussian headquarters, spent the winter at Versailles, and during all those months did practically nothing." of his great gifts and capacities he made no further use even down to the end of his life and the end came early 
but he is entitled to be remembered as a man who at one supreme moment accomplished one of the most brilliant exploits in the history of journalism let us judge him by his best and so judged his name must take its place with those of russell mcgann forbes stevens and others of that rank if there are any others one more remark to remind you how alien from the mind of the british journalist at that time was the free use of the telegraph which in america had become a thing of every day when white sat down to write he said to me i suppose i am to condense as much as possible no write fully but it is going by cable yes it will be some columns long the longer the better he thought a little then said i still don't quite understand then please put the cable out of your mind and write exactly as if you were writing for a london paper and the printer's devil waiting and he did end of chapter twenty four Chapter Twenty Five of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Great Examples of War Correspondence. But Sedan, from the Prussian point of view, was one thing. From the French, it might be, and must be, quite another. Monsieur Maginel, had things gone otherwise, might have been expected to give us the French version, but since he was with the French headquarters in Sedan, he was presumably a prisoner of war, and nothing was to be hoped for from him. Mr. Holt White, fresh from the field, thought there was little or no chance. No one except Mr. White had got through from either army. The English papers of Monday morning were a blank, except for a few rather ragged telegrams. Mr. Robinson, at the Daily News, had nothing. There was a lull. I am speaking of war news proper, for there was, of course, the one great event of Saturday in Paris, and there was no certainty whence the next flash of light, or lightning, would come. Sedan had been fought on Thursday, and it was now Monday afternoon. While I sat in the Tribune office in Pall Mall, brooding on these difficulties, and almost despairing of further good fortune, the door opened, and in walked Maginal. He had not telegraphed, he had a Gallic indifference to time and to the technique of journalism. He had just come as soon as he could. An angel from heaven would have been less welcome. Were you in Sedan during the battle? Yes, and outside with the army. Were you taken prisoner? yes you were released well i forget whether i was released or whether i escaped to escape meant that he had taken his chance of being shot by a prussian sentry and also of being rearrested and tried by court-martial should he fall again into prussian hands released therefore seemed the better word of the two have you written your account no i had no means of writing while a prisoner and i have since been doing my best to get to london as in white's case there was time enough maginel had an english side to him his mother was english and that half of him was imperturbable neither the danger he had passed nor the task that lay before him all inexperienced as he was shook his nerves he was quite ready to sit down and write at once as in White's case, I copied sheet by sheet. Maginot's English was here and there at fault, but was, on the whole, good. What was more important, his memory was precise. He knew how to tell his story clearly, and he gave us a picture of the battle horrors from within the beleaguered town or from within the French defense, which he made the reader see as he himself had seen them, he wrote on till he had filled four columns, modestly wondering, as he wrote, whether he was not too diffuse, wondering that it should be thought worth cabling, wondering whether his English was good enough, and wondering whether the military part of it was not all nonsense. Reassured on all these points, he wrote fluently and joyfully, at midnight laying down his pen with the remark, Enfin, je vide mon sac. Monsieur Maginel's dispatch appeared in the Tribune, complete on Tuesday morning. Neither Mr. Weaver nor the Newfoundland lines were out of order this time. 
The Tribune had, therefore, within less than three days of the first coming of the news of the Battle of Sedan, given to the American public complete accounts, ten columns altogether, of the battle from the Prussian side and from the French side, a unique performance. Nor was this all. The revolution in Paris and the declaration of the Republic, September 4th, were dealt with not less fully and, of course, by cable. During four days, the number of words cabled was a little over 16,000, at a cost of as many dollars. If we never rose again to quite those heights, it was because never again was there such a quick sequence of great events. But for a long time, the daily average was high, and not long after this, the daily news service became efficient, and, as I have said before, the Tribune, in the end, profited by it. Before, however, the full advantage of that accrued came the surrender of Metz, October 27th, and the remarkable narrative, including a visit to Metz, published simultaneously by the Daily News and the Tribune. It was supposed in London that Mr. Archibald Forbes was the author of this narrative, and it was reckoned among his best performances. The Daily News never thought it worth while to state the truth, nor was it bound to make any statement. The real author was Mr. Gustav Müller, a correspondent in the employment of the Tribune. As in the other cases I have described, Mr. Gustav Müller came to London and wrote his accounts in the Tribune office. It was cabled forthwith to New York, and a copy handed to the Daily News. It was the first to be published in London, and the first to be published in New York. So far as London is concerned, it is enough to say that the Times on the following morning copied it from the Daily News, crediting it to the Daily News with a deserved compliment, and saying, We congratulate our contemporary on the energy and enterprise of its correspondent. Still, Mr. Robinson did not think it needful to explain that it was, in fact, a Tribune dispatch, and that it was a Tribune correspondent who had wrung from the Times this testimony. The tale has a tragic end. For a long time I thought it a tragedy of death. I sent Mr. Gustav Müller back to the field at once with a large sum of money. I never heard from him again. Inquiries in every possible quarter brought no tidings of him. It seemed plain that he had fallen in battle, or had been murdered and robbed by some of the bands that hang on the outskirts of every army. Some years after I told the whole story in Harper's Magazine, leaving the mystery unexplained, otherwise than by conjecture, when, lo, it appeared that Mr. Gustav Müller had not fallen by a French bullet or a brigand's knife, but was alive in New York and ready to submit to an interview. If he were truly reported, he seemed to think his conduct in no need of defense. He had changed his mind, and instead of returning to the field, had gone home. Why he never wrote to me, or communicated in any way with the Tribune, he omitted to say. As I have stripped one leaf from Mr. Forbes' laurels, I will add that two of the most brilliant news exploits in all the history of war journalism are to be credited to him. One was his night ride of a 110 miles alone through a hostile country after the British victory of Ulundi, July 4, 1879. Lord Chelmsford, commanding the British forces, had refused Forbes leave to start and given orders for his arrest. He risked the British bullets and the Zulu Asajis and got through. The other was at the ship Capas in August 1877. It was the crisis of the Russo-Turkish War. General Gurko was holding the pass. Suleiman Pasha, day after day, was flinging his whole force against the Russian entrenchments. The world was waiting. No news came. The Russians and Turks were not people who concerned themselves much about public opinion. Forbes was at Bucharest. Tired of expecting messages from the scene, he rode to the pass made his way through the Turks and into the Russian lines, stayed in the trenches till he had satisfied himself, and he was a competent judge, that Suleiman's efforts was spent, and that Gurko could hold his own, and then made his way out again, hoping to reach Bucharest in time for a dispatch that night to the Daily News. 
at or near Chernova, he was stopped by the russians and taken before the czar the czar like the rest of the world was without news he had sent one aide-de-camp after another to the pass no one had returned forbes used to say that the czar treated him very well he asked if it was true that forbes had been with general gurko and when told it was desired that the exact situation should be explained to him forbes set it forth with that military clearness and precision which made his work in the field invaluable the czar asked him if he could draw a plan he drew it all sorts of questions were put to him he answered all he was asked for his opinion i told his imperial majesty that i had been a soldier that i had much experience of battles as a correspondent and that i had no doubt general gurko would hold the pass the interview lasted an hour or more at the end i besought his majesty's permission to continue my journey saying i thought nothing was known in europe and that it was for the interest of russia that the facts which i had had the honour to lay before his imperial majesty should be made public the czar thanked me for the information i had given declared himself convinced it was true and my judgment well founded and dismissed me so forbes rode on arriving at bucharest the first point from which it was possible to telegraph at eight o'clock in the evening it was forbes himself who told me the story i had been in the saddle or in the trenches and under fire for three days and nights without sleep and with little food when i walked into the hotel at bucharest i was a beaten man i felt as if i could not keep awake or sit in my chair much less write yet it was an opportunity which does not come twice in a man's life i had and nobody else had the news for which all europe was hungering the most momentous news since sedan but not one word written and not an ounce of strength left well what did you do the answer was curious indeed i called the waiter and told him to bring me a pint of champagne unopened i uncorked it put the neck of the bottle into my mouth before the gas had time to escape and drank the whole of the wine then i sat up and wrote the four columns which appeared next morning in the daily news i remember that narrative well there was not in it from beginning to end a trace of fatigue or confusion it was a bulletin of war written with masterly ease with the most admirable freshness and force nothing better of the kind was ever done it rang from one end of europe to the other and across the atlantic the hour and the man in this case had come together and if forbes had done nothing else this would entitle him to the immortality which is his all the same the pint of champagne was a hazardous experiment forbes knew it but as he said it was that or nothing the next man who tries it ought to be very sure that he has both the intellectual elasticity Forbes had and his physique. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 A Parenthesis to what i have said of journalism i need not add much i remained in london as the representative of the new york tribune and in charge of its european affairs from eighteen sixty seven to eighteen ninety five returning then to new york and washington for the times till nineteen o five when the tribune began publishing a sunday edition one other innovation upon the established practice followed i sent each week by cable a column containing a summary view of what seemed most important during the week it was not a summary of news and it was not a leading article but a compromise between the two it was at any rate the first of its kind and i was allowed to put it in such shape as i thought best since then the american demand for what are called sunday cables has grown the dispatches to all the great journals of the united states have increased in number in length in variety and in daring all i claim for mine is that it was the first 
i do not know whether any work in journalism has in it the elements of permanency probably not journalism is an expression of the governing forces of the day and day by day changes as the forces change and the days change but should a history of international journalism be written the historian will perhaps remember that as agent of the tribune i set up in london that european news bureau which all other great american journals after some years copied that i was in charge of it during the franco-german war and that the success of the tribune during that war was due to the system already described which i had established three years before the years that follow are full of miscellaneous interests the memories some of which are reprinted in this volume are not primarily historical though i hope they are accurate they are impressions they cannot be presented as a sequence and as each chapter or group of chapters deals with a separate subject i republish most of them in the order in which they were written and printed or otherwise as may seem convenient i pass now to an incident of the irish war and then to a diplomatic experiment in the history of those long contentious relations between canada and the united states which have so often imperiled the friendship between england and the united states End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven Civil War Incidents in the Eighties Sir George Trevelyan Lord Barrymore. The streets of London were red one day in November nineteen o nine with placards proclaiming The Lords Declare Civil War. I suppose the radicals thought it paid to force the note mr winston churchill was their bandmaster for the moment there is no more effective political rhetorician provided you accept that fallacy about the folly of the people against which the warning of mr lincoln passes unheeded but there was at least on one side a state of feeling in the country comparable to nothing i can remember except the feeling which prevailed during the home rule crisis and far stronger now than then in that crisis also the lords came to the rescue of the kingdom which they saved from disintegration and ruin ruin for the moment it would have been only to be finally averted by the reconquest of ireland even to the spectator those were stirring days england and ireland from eighteen eighty one onward had become the wild west the revolver was the real safeguard of personal liberty i don't think it will be quite like that now but it does seem as if the bitterness of contention and the personalities of politics would go further now than then perhaps have already gone further i was in ireland for a fortnight during one of the worst periods but there were times when london was as disturbed and distressful as ireland itself those were years of dynamite in england when as lord randolph churchill said the railway stations were flying about our ears and when london bridge came near being blown up and when englishmen in high places were targets from the prime minister down to his youngest colleague no man was safe without a guard of detectives and not then mr gladstone whose courage was high shook off his escort whenever he could other ministers paid more respect to a very real danger sir george trevelyan who was appointed chief secretary for ireland in eighteen eighty two submitted sensibly to the precautions the home office in scotland yard thought needful one afternoon i met trevelyan in a bond street shop we left the shop together two quite innocent-looking men were outside the door i hope you don't mind said trevelyan i am obliged to let them follow me they were scotland yard detectives as we walked down the street they were within earshot all the way their vigilance unrelaxing whether they thought their ward in greater or less danger because i was with him i cannot say we parted at the corner of piccadilly in both streets the throng on the sidewalk was dense but through it these men made their way without violence without haste but never for an instant allowing themselves to be separated from the chief secretary by so much as an arm's length 
he walked in peril not only real but eminent two days before his appointment as chief secretary his predecessor lord frederick cavendish and mr burke permanent under secretary had been murdered to accept that inheritance of probable assassination was a gallant act quite characteristic of sir george trevelyan but i do not imagine that he or his friends ever while he held that office forgot what had happened in phoenix park not many evenings later i met sir george trevelyan at dinner if he had not been famous as a writer and member of parliament and irish secretary and much else he might well have been famous as a diner out he had the art of conversation his uncle's influence had left him in this respect untouched where macaulay discoursed and reeled off dreary pages of encyclopedic knowledge trevelyan talked lightly and well claiming no monopoly preaching no sermon wearying no company too well bred to show itself bored he had a felicity of allusion which was so wholly free from pedantry as to seem almost accidental his voice like browning's was strident and his laugh sometimes boisterous but this was in moments of excitement on this particular evening there was something besides his inspiriting talk which drew the attention of the company so long as the ladies were at table he talked with his wonted energy when the dining-room door had closed on the last of these departing angels trevelyan sank into his chair with a sigh drew a revolver from the breast pocket of his coat laid it on the table and said to his host pray forgive me but if you knew how tired i am of carrying this thing about on sir george trevelyan as on others the irish secretaryship left its mark a year of office aged him as if it were ten he came out worn and grey not yet forty-five years old the tragedy was in one particular a tragic comedy half his moustache had turned white the other half black as before and i suppose it shook his nerve more or less and was perhaps responsible for that fickleness of purpose or of view which led him first to oppose and then to adopt mr gladstone's policy of home rule i saw one side of the irish question during a visit to lord barrymore and then mr smith barry and his beautiful american wife at fota island near queenstown mr william o'brien had launched shortly before this his new tipperary scheme of which one main object was to ruin mr smith barry who owned the old tipperary assassination was then only a political incident or instrument mr smith barry moreover was hated not only as a landowner but for having organized the one efficient defence against the spoliation of the landlords which down to that time had been discovered he had formed a company and raised a large sum of money among his english friends he himself being the largest contributor so he held the o'brien cohorts at bay at what money cost and at what personal risk few men knew but i apprehend that but for mr smith barry the plan of campaign and new tipperary would have succeeded and the south of ireland been handed over to the land league one night as i was on my way from my room to the drawing-room on the other side of the hall i saw by the front door a big man in a blue cavalry cloak and cap who had just entered he was laying aside his cloak as i passed and took out of their holsters first one and then another navy revolver both seven shooters i said too flippantly you take good care of yourself he turned on me sharply with a questioning look of keen eyes under heavy eyebrows are you a friend of smithbury i should hardly be staying in his house if i were not then i will tell you how you can best prove your friendship get him to carry what i carry is he in danger danger there's a detective at this moment behind every tree about the house and even so we don't know what may happen we hope he is safe here at home but he goes about unarmed and it is known he is unarmed and no man who does that can be sure of his life we have tried our best to make him take care of himself he will not now do you try 
this sudden outburst this appeal this flash of light upon the scene were all impressive the big man it turned out was the chief constable of the county he knew whereof he spoke i promised to do what i could and i talked with mr smithberry he was a man equally remarkable for courage and for coolness but in matters affecting his personal safety he did not use the judgment for which in other matters he was distinguished he could not be persuaded that anybody would think it worth while to kill him he knew well enough that the shooting of landlords had become a popular pastime but he could not or would not understand why he himself should be shot i am on good terms with my tenants my rents are fair rents i evict nobody what have they to gain by shooting me but it was not from his own tenants that trouble was expected it was not because mr smith barry was not a good landlord but because he was the leader of the landlords in the south of ireland and the most formidable opponent of the league that his life was threatened it may be so he said but i think i will go on as i am and from that nobody could move him now as it happened shortly before i left london i had met one of the chief officials in the home office who said to me you are going to ireland yes but how do you know never mind how i know what i want to say to you is take a revolver with you i was on the point of making a light answer but stopped if you get a hint of that kind from a man who rules over the criminal department of the home office and the police generally you accept it and do as you are told i had a revolver with me therefore and when the time came to go back to london i left it in its case on mr smithberry's writing-table with a letter asking him to accept it from me and once more begging him to carry it if only that it might be known that he carried it or if only out of friendship to me this prevailed he wrote me that he still thought we made a useless fuss about it but he could not refuse the gift and he could not refuse to carry it no letter ever pleased me more i have never again seen my friend the chief constable but i have never forgotten him and i think of him now as a fine impersonation of that authority of the law which in those turbulent days he asserted and successfully maintained against great odds End of chapter twenty seven Chapter twenty eight of Anglo American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight Sir Wilfrid Laurier and the Alaska Boundary. One The name of Empire Builder is used freely of late, perhaps too freely. It is so great a name that it ought to be kept for the great men, for the real builders and creators, for Clive, for Rhodes and their like there is another class somewhat more numerous but not much who keep together the great imperial patrimony which others have handed down to them they might perhaps be called wardens of empire of whom sir wilfrid laurier may stand for an example my memories of sir wilfrid laurier go back to those years when the alaska boundary dispute between canada and the united states approached its crisis lord minto was then governor-general of canada mr mckinley was president of the united states mr hay was the american secretary of state there was strong feeling on both sides it appeared later that it was stronger in canada than in the united states but in both countries there was hot blood and in both the controversy turned in part upon gold we were carrying on under a modus vivendi a state of things which tended to tranquilize the minds of men but the modus vivendi did not cover the whole of the alaskan territory then in dispute and there was anxiety both in washington and ottawa i went to ottawa on a visit spent a week at government house and there first came to know sir wilfrid laurier who had been prime minister of the dominion since eighteen ninety six first impressions are best and i set down my first impressions though they do not much differ from the last and though in one way they were wholly deceptive and misleading for sir wilfrid came so softly into the drawing-room at government house that you would never have thought him a leader of men 
he had something of the ecclesiastic about him and something of the diplomatist the first perhaps suggested itself because he was a roman catholic and to that faith all my puritan prejudices were alien as i think it over i know of no fact in the current history of the british empire more significant than the fact that the greatest dominion of this great british and protestant power should have been governed for thirteen years by a roman catholic and a frenchman that is catholicism in its broadest sense and not in the sense of mere loyalty to a pope and to a particular church taking the population of canada as something over six millions to-day nearly one half are roman catholics the other half are implacable protestants how are they to live together in amity but they do and one of the reasons of this amity is sir wilfrid laurier if he were a leader of men in the military sense or as chatham was a leader one of two things would have happened quebec and ontario would have quarrelled or sir wilfrid would have ceased to be prime minister booted and spurred and in the saddle not so is canada to be ruled nor are the conflicting interests and sentiments of the eastern and western sections of the great dominion so to be harmonized but the smooth subtlety of the priest and the suavity of the diplomatist are means of conciliation thus i imagine has sir wilfrid worked thus does he present himself to the company at government house he glides into the room he is not humble far from it but his is perhaps the pride which apes humility sweetness enters with him and light if i may once more unite rather overworked substantives which have come down to us from swift he does light up the room as he enters and the faces of those who are already in it his coming is a delight to everybody and now we know what is before us his manner as he receives and returns the greetings of his friends is distinctly french after all the guests have arrived and the governor-general and lady minto have entered the room sir wilfrid's homage to the representative of the sovereign and to lady minto has an essentially parisian elegance nobody would mistake him for an englishman by birth or race he is english politically and officially none more loyal to the king of england and england herself than he but personally he is french taller however than the average frenchman and of a larger frame the head is well set the forehead broad and high a soft light in the eyes till something is said which sets them burning the mouth firm and the whole face in contour and expression quite as much that of the man of thought as action there are not many men of whom another man uses the word charm but sir wilfrid is one and women use it of him more freely still he talked easily and well he speaks english and french with equal fluency with finnish also and is never at a loss for an idiomatic phrase yet the english is not quite the english heard to-day in london nor is his french parisian the canadians have in addition to many other kinds the patriotism of language quebec has its own french the french of the eighteenth century or of terrain to-day and toronto its own english also now and then slightly archaic yet in toronto dwells and has long dwelt the first of living writers of living english i mean mr goldwin smith the fires of his intellectual youth still at eighty-three unquenched and by another paradox the english author of the best political history of the united states canada does not like his canadian views but they remain his views just as he for all his canadian residence remains english perhaps it is part of sir wilfrid's diplomacy that he practises both these varieties of french and english speech he takes liberties with each language as a man who is master of both is entitled to and in each his soft tones are persuasive nothing seems to come amiss to him the social topics of ottawa have not quite the same range as in london but to the people of ottawa they are not less engrossing even scandal was not unknown in those days and gossip floated about and sometimes politics came to the top as they will anywhere when they are not too trivial and even when they are 
Ottawa was, at any rate, with its 50,000 people and its lumber trade, the capital of Sir Wilfrid's kingdom. Parliament was sitting in that finely placed Parliament House, crowning the cliff on the river, and all Canada was there, in the substantial persons of its delegates and ministers. Before I left, I came to know all, or nearly all, the ministers. Lunching one day with Sir Wilfrid at the Rideau Club, I found myself in a group of a dozen or more political personages, all, I think, in office. They struck me as able men with a gift of business-like talk. But there were not two Sir Wilfrid Lauriers. The long reign of Sir John MacDonald had not proved fertile in new men. Sir John was a sort of Canadian Diaz, and had done for the Dominion not what the President of the great Central American Republic had done for Mexico, but a service not less personal and individual. Both had been dictators. Both had known how to use the forms of representative government in such a way as to consolidate and perpetuate arbitrary personal power, and for something like the same period. In a way, Sir Wilfrid has done a similar thing, only you never could think a minister of these endearing manners arbitrary. There is a more important difference still. Sir John MacDonald had organized political corruption into a system. Sir Wilfrid is free from any such imputation as that. Charges have been heard against some of his ministers, never against Sir Wilfrid. It was perhaps by accident that we began to discuss the Alaska boundary, or perhaps not by accident. I do not know. Thinking the matter over afterward, it seemed possible enough that Sir Wilfrid had shaped events in his own mind from the first. He may have been glad of an opportunity to communicate with Washington indirectly and unofficially, or desirous that the President should know what was in his mind and learn it otherwise than via London. He was very anxious, as well he might be. I had lately been in Washington, and knew pretty well the views of the President and of Mr. Hay. I had made two or three visits to Ottawa before the Alaska conversations with Sir Wilfrid took place. In the interval, Mr. McKinley had ceased to be President. He had been murdered by a foreigner with an unpronounceable name, and while the murderer was waiting in his cell to be executed, the American women, suffragists of the militant kind, had sent him, to quote an American writer, flowers, jellies, books, and sympathy. The discipline of the prison did not forbid these gifts. Mr. Roosevelt had become president. Mr. Hay remained secretary of state, perhaps with a hand less free than he had under Mr. McKinley, who was aware that he himself was not master of all subjects, or perhaps of any subject, not essentially American. When the moment came, Sir Wilfrid began casually enough, in a way that would have allowed him to stop whenever he chose. But he went on, and after a talk at Government House one day, asked me to call on him at Parliament House on the morrow. There again the talk continued, and it was followed by one still longer when Sir Wilfrid came back to Government House next day with papers and maps. Over these we spent some hours— there were few details in all the complicated Alaska business which were not familiar to him, and of the whole question he had a grasp which made details almost unimportant. His view struck me as reasoned, detached, with a settled purpose behind it. He was quite ready for compromise. I never knew a statesman anywhere who was not, with the possible exception of the ninety-two statesmen who composed the United States Senate. For myself, I had to look two ways. I was obliged, that is, to understand both points of view, the Canadian and the American, for I was then the representative of the Times in the United States. When we had gone over the whole matter, I said to Sir Wilfrid that I thought I understood his opinions and the policy he desired to follow. But what was I to do? Not a word of what he had said to me could have been intended for print, nor can it be printed now, even after all these years and after the settlement. But some object he must have had, and I asked him if I was at liberty to draw any inference from these interviews. I was leaving Ottawa the next day. Are you going to Washington? Yes. Shall you see the President or Mr. Hay? Both. 
well if you think anything you have heard here likely to interest the president or mr hay i don't see why you should not discuss the matter with them as you have with me if they choose the story of what happened at washington i reserve for another chapter but sir wilfrid's way of dealing with the subject on this occasion may perhaps stand for an example of what i have called his diplomatic manner he was not over solicitous about precedents or formalities he was quite ready to avail himself of such opportunities as chance offered him and of such instruments as came in his way his absolute good faith was beyond question if his suggestions or rather the frank statement of his own view and of what he was ready to do had proved acceptable at washington he would have put them into official shape and there would presently have been a dispatch from the foreign office to the state department and history would have been differently written why this did not happen will appear when the washington end of the story is told two leaving ottawa the day after the last of these conversations with the canadian prime minister i went to washington there i saw both the president and mr hay i said of course i had no authority to bind sir wilfrid laurier to anything but i had a strong impression and this impression i laid before them as a matter of convenience i had drawn up a memorandum of which i had sent sir wilfrid laurier a copy when mr hay asked me whether i had any notes of my conversations with the canadian prime minister i handed him this memorandum rather a long document he wished it read to him and it was then we talked it over mr hay said i suppose you will see the president i shall see him also but i think it will be better you should make your statement to him separately my belief is that both of them would have been disposed to consider the canadian prime minister's attitude a reasonable one and if an official proposal in that sense had been made and if it had rested with the president to say yes or no he would have accepted it but acceptance involved a treaty and what was the use of agreeing to a treaty which had to run the gauntlet of the united states senate the graveyard of treaties the senate at that time was in one of its most irreconcilable moods in truth the president had found himself more than once in collision with the senate and the moment was not propitious certain senators moreover had fixed opinions as to the proper disposition of this alaska dispute and from these opinions it was known they would not depart at another time when i hope to have something to say about mr roosevelt i may add a little though not much to this brief account it can never be treated except with great reserve i had told sir wilfrid when i said good-bye that i feared the senate would prove an invincible obstacle to an agreement i saw the president several times and the whole matter was gone into after my last conversation with him which did not end till past one o'clock in the morning i wrote sir wilfrid that i saw no chance at present of carrying the matter further he answered very kindly but regretfully and so all this ended without result for the time being i add only that the sagacity of the canadian the statesmanlike sagacity impressed the president and mr hay alike if it had been possible to lay the whole story before the senate it might have impressed that body also but jefferson's phrase about government by newspapers applies or part of it applies to the senate or shall i say to part of the senate whatever is known to the senate soon becomes known to the newspapers a single illustration will suffice the senate transacts executive business in secret session the galleries are cleared the press gallery as well as the others but within an hour of the close of an executive session a full abstract of its proceedings is in the hands of the press agents besides i had no authority to repeat what sir wilfrid had said to anybody but the president and mr a sir wilfrid is a man so free from official pedantry or even conventionalities that i think it likely he would have agreed to an informal communication to the senate but he was not asked there was no occasion to ask him the objections were too evident mr hay said anything i favor the senate will oppose of the president some very leading senators were not less suspicious 
there was to be no agreement until the senate could dictate terms the subsequent agreement for an alaska boundary commission was a senate agreement it did not provide for arbitration if it had the senate would have rejected it it was not supposed that a tribunal composed of three members from each side would reach a decision all men now know that if it did it was because the lord chief justice of england conceived it to be his duty to vote in accordance with the facts and the law he had not laid aside his judicial character when he became a commissioner as it was lord alverston's vote which turned the scale in favour of the united states the canadians attacked him with bitterness he made one reply and one only and even this had no direct reference to canada speaking at a dinner in london he said if when any kind of arbitration is set up they don't want a decision based on the law and the evidence they must not put a british judge on the commission writing as an american i think it due to lord alveston to say that nothing ever did more to convince americans of british fairness than his act it was his act also that put to rest a controversy which in the opinion of canadian statesmen and american statesmen alike contained elements of the gravest danger to peace if he had done nothing else he would take his place in history as a great lord chief justice the briton is so constituted that it is probable he admires lord alverston formerly richard and then sir richard webster almost as much for his renown in sport as for his professional eminence of which to be tubman and then postman in the court of exchequer was one part he was and is an athlete and used to win running races and perhaps still could being now only sixty-seven years of age you used always to hear him spoken of as dick webster at cambridge university he had such eminence in the study of mathematics as entitled him to be thirty-fifth wrangler and in the more humane letters so much proficiency as made him third-class classic in the schools that is he was less energetic than on the track but success at the bar does not depend on the differential calculus or on latin and greek within ten years after being called he was q c and having found a seat in parliament became attorney-general in lord salisbury's government in eighteen eighty five to six within seventeen years he had reached the highest unjudicial place in his profession he held the same office three times then was made master of the rolls the judge who in point of dignity comes next after the lord chancellor and the lord chief justice and finally in nineteen hundred lord chief justice of england during his service at the bar he had been a great patent lawyer with an income which rumour put at thirty thousand pounds or a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this country perhaps the maximum outside of the parliamentary bar such is a bare outline of the career in all respects distinguished honourable stainless of the man on whom canada poured out criticism which did not stop short of vituperation they need no answer if they did it was not my place to answer them not one human being in england believed lord alveston capable of the dishonesty which the canadian papers imputed to him i am afraid i must add that sir wilfrid laurier was one of lord alverston's critics the feeling throughout canada was so strong that he had perhaps no choice or no choice but between that and either resignation or defeat no pilot could weather that storm the feeling of canada was emotional what he said he said as prime minister yet whether as prime minister or as sir wilfrid laurier he must have rejoiced in the settlement even though it were at the expense of canadian claims i do not think canada had any valid claims or had a case which before any impartial tribunal could have been maintained but whether she had or not it was for her interest to see them once for all swept away and peace and good feeling established between her and her neighbour our canadian friends must have been aware at the time that they stood alone in their attacks on lord alverston they had no backing in england 
no english newspaper ever suggested that lord alverston had voted otherwise than according to his conscience england knew him to be incorruptible and unassailable and laughed at the suggestion that he did not understand the canadian claims it was because he understood them that he decided against them the english it is true have thought themselves unlucky in arbitrations and have fallen into the habit of expecting an adverse decision from an arbitration tribunal the geneva tribunal instilled into them that reluctant expectation but as this was not an arbitration but simply a commission for determining the true boundary line of alaska they accepted in a sporting spirit the judgment of their own lord chief justice how could they do otherwise on the constitution of the tribunal and on the claims of senator lodge and senator turner to be impartial they had remarks to make on the other hand were the canadian members impartial there can be no harm now in saying that sir wilfrid looked upon the alaskan situation with gloomy forebodings so did everybody on both sides of the border everybody who understood the situation and would give himself the trouble to think and had a sense of responsibility in the disputed belt of territory alaskan territory which the united states claimed and canada claimed gold might at any moment be discovered there would come a rush from both sides we all know what the gold miners are a rough lot not always recognizing any law but the law of the strongest and most covetous they make laws for themselves and even those they do not keep many of them are desperate many ruined many outlaws many have no other hope than in finding gold somewhere and getting it anyhow they are all armed revolvers are the arbitrators whose decisions they respect in the presence of new-found gold what are boundaries or titles or international relations inevitably they would cross the border into the debatable land canadians and americans alike what would the flag mean to bankrupt gamblers who saw once more the hope of riches there would be disputes there would be collisions at any moment a shot might be fired and then what the risk was awful this i have no doubt was the risk sir wilfrid had in mind it meant nothing less than the possibility of war between great britain and the united states gold once discovered the possibility became a probability could a canadian statesman could an american statesman think of that hazard and not be willing to do much or even to concede much in order to avert it yet of all the men of both nationalities with whom then and after i have talked about alaska sir wilford alone had a clear view of the danger and he alone was willing to do what was absolutely necessary to make war impossible for that reason he stands forth a great patriot a great canadian a great englishman worldwide as is his fame he deserves a greater it is not yet possible to do him full justice it may never be but his views and proposals and large wisdom as they were set forth in these conversations put him in my opinion in the very front rank of statesmen of his time the impression they made on the president and mr hay was profound they too were statesmen but their hands were tied it is further to be borne in mind that the northwestern border was in a ferment that great belt of powerful states conterminous with canada had long nursed its grievances the alaska question did not stand alone it never has there were questions of duties of tariffs of lumber rights of the rights of lake and canal navigation of fisheries atlantic and pacific and many others thirteen specific subjects in all they had once been all but settled the high commissioners in the last conference at washington had come to terms on all but alaska when in an unlucky moment lord herschel believing he could force the hand of the americans put forth an ultimatum out of a blue sky it must be all or none there must be no settlement which does not include alaska lord herschel had been thought of a contentious mind all through americans bore with that 
but to an ultimatum an agreement at the mouth of a gun we would not submit so the whole went off what was the result there came a time when sir wilfrid himself had to announce that there would be no more pilgrimages to washington nor have there been End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of anglo-american memories by george washburn smalley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine annexing canada lady aberdeen lady minto the first person with whom i heard of the american immigration into canada was sir wilfrid laurier he told me it had begun quietly a few american farmers drifting across the border in search of better and cheaper land than could be had at home there was no sound of drum or trumpet these men had nothing to do with the talk of annexation they had no political object their object was agricultural only that and nothing more it is possible enough that the reputed riches of the northwest province of canada had something to do with the policy if it can be called a policy of the american annexationists desiring to fire the hearts of the farmers in illinois and minnesota who saw the yield of their wheat lands diminishing yearly it seems never to have occurred to the politicians that the farmers were quite capable of looking after their own interests and that it was cheaper to buy land than to make war for it the movement had at the time of this conversation in nineteen o two been going on for years beginning by scores it had risen to hundreds yearly then thousands sir wilfrid computed that there were altogether some fifty or sixty thousand american settlers in the canadian northwest and that the yearly exodus from the states had reached six thousand but does that not raise or threaten to raise a political issue oh it is much too soon to think of that nevertheless i imagine sir wilfrid did think of it and it may have been present to lord grey's mind when he launched his memorable declaration at the waldorf hotel two years later now the number of americans who are moving northward and acquiring canadian soil is computed at a hundred thousand yearly or more the political difficulty if there were one would seem to be met by the canadian law allowing aliens to hold land but requiring them to become canadians at the end of three years i am told there is such a law but i do not know in truth the political difficulty has never outgrown manageable limits there has always been more or less tall talk about annexing canada eloquent phrases have been heard one continent one flag or the stars and stripes from the gulf of mexico to the arctic circle but no party has taken up this cry one newspaper in new york the sun did for a time preach annexation the sun is a journal which does not disdain sensations and has taught its readers to expect them and from time to time fulfils the expectations it excites the editor at that time was mr paul dana son of the mr charles a dana who made the sun a powerful journal mr paul dana started a society to promote the acquisition of canada the capital of the society was a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand pounds that was the sum which mr paul dana and his friends thought sufficient or were able to raise if they did raise it to sever from the british empire a dominion larger than the united states without alaska capable in military opinion of self-defence but in any case with the military and naval power of great britain behind it mr paul dana however did not pursue matters to the bitter end he has ceased to be editor of the sun and canada remains british i do not know whether his annexation society is still in existence but the american appetite for canada never keen has grown duller still men's minds turn to other things the philippines and hawaii and puerto rico and the defence of the pacific coast are more than enough to occupy our attention the senate itself has grown tractable and on the chief points of difference an agreement has been reached 
where five years ago no agreement seemed possible two years after sir wilfrid laurier became prime minister the somewhat agitated and perhaps agitating governor-generalship of lord aberdeen came to an end i suppose the cause of the troubled waters on which that particular ship of state was tossed was not to be found wholly or mainly in lord aberdeen himself but in the multitudinous energies of lady aberdeen her convictions were strong her zeal was continuous her certainty of being in the right was a certainty she shared with her sex or with all those women who think public affairs their proper sphere she had many admirable qualities and a courage which shrank from no adventure merely because it was an adventure her zeal in the cause of home rule for ireland is well known it had been shown in dublin it was shown now in ottawa it crossed the border and hung out a flag in chicago in the chicago exhibition or as it was officially called the world's columbian exposition in eighteen ninety three there was among other attractions an irish village this village lady aberdeen took under her patronage and over it she hoisted an irish flag of the kind in which the home rule heart rejoices a flag with the harp but without the crown if lady aberdeen had done this as a private individual it could hardly have been allowed to pass but she did it as wife of the governor-general of the dominion of canada there were official remonstrances and the flag was lowered against an indiscretion of that kind may be set many useful and charitable enterprises begun or encouraged by this lady in ottawa and all over canada she is kindly remembered there and her visits to canada since lord aberdeen ceased to be governor-general have been welcomed but there are many stories of her crusading spirit besides the ones i have told and i suppose the canadians really like to live a more peaceful life than they were allowed to when lady aberdeen ruled over them lord minto succeeded lord aberdeen sir wilfrid laurier was prime minister during the whole of lord minto's term and mr chamberlain was secretary for the colonies down to the last year i suppose it may be remarked that seldom have three great officials worked in a harmony more complete than did these three it can hardly be necessary to say anything of mr chamberlain except this that his masterfulness never made itself felt in canada in such a way as to weaken but always in such a way as to strengthen the tie between the motherland and the colony his imperialism took account of the dominion as well as of the empire it took equal account for all purposes it was under this strong hand that canada felt her independence perhaps for the first time completely safeguarded between lord minto and sir wilfrid laurier there was on all subjects an understanding that is not the same thing as saying they never differed which would be absurd but they had before them the same high objects and they pretty well agreed as to the means of attaining them the relations between government house and parliament house where the prime minister had his headquarters were cordial frank unrestrained and delightful that there should be relations of that kind between the representative of the crown and the representative of the dominion is of equal advantage to the crown and to the dominion they have not always existed but there seems every reason to believe they will exist in the future as they did in lord minto's time and as they do now that lord grey speaks for the sovereign and sir wilfrid laurier is still the trusted prime minister of a dominion which has grown too great to be called a colony as i have mentioned lady aberdeen i may say a word though for a different reason about lady menton who for six years was the idol of ottawa and of the whole dominion if ever there was an example of tact and felicity in the discharge of the duties that fall to the wife of a governor-general lady mento was that example what need be added except that the statement is not a compliment but a testimony the canadian press has paid its tribute and there are other tributes 
one is that in quebec and toronto the capital of the french roman catholic province and the capital of the british protestant province lady minto was equally popular and equally beloved in a very literal but strictly correct and conventional sense it may be said that she was a power in the dominion the receptions at government house were very interesting perhaps sometimes curious as an example of democracy undergoing a social evolution in all the commonwealths beyond the seas the same process i presume may be studied when lady carrington issued three thousand invitations to a reception at government house in sydney the limit had perhaps been reached for the time there can be no such throng at government house in ottawa because it is not large enough perhaps it is not quite large enough for the dignity of the dominion in these days of its amazing growth and ever increasing importance but ottawa though a flourishing city is not a great city it is a compromise capital the middle term in which the rivalries of quebec on the one hand and toronto on the other found a means of peace on neutral and central ground end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Anglo-American Memories by George Washburn Smalley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty: Two Governors General, Lord Minto and Lord Grey. Lord Minto has now passed from the great post of Governor General of the Dominion to the still greater Vice Royalty of India, but I apprehend it will be long before his reign in Canada is forgotten possibly the canadians might not use and may not like the word rain they are a susceptible as well as a great people they are jealous of their liberties which are in no danger and of the word american to which they have some claim overshadowed though it be by their greater neighbour on the south i have seen more instances than one of canadian sensitiveness of which i will take the simplest Having to pay for a purchase in an Ottawa shop, I asked the shopkeeper whether he would take an American banknote. He answered, with a flushed face, We consider our money as much American as yours. We have the same right as you to the name American. Oh, by all means. But what do you call our money? United States bills. And what do you call me? But to that simple question he had no answer ready and I rather imagine the time has come, or is coming, when the Canadian may be as proud of the name which identifies him with the northern half of the continent as we are of the adjective we have to share, more or less, with others. I never heard of a Mexican calling himself an American, but I believe the Latin races to the South do, and forget sometimes to put South before it lord mento was governor-general while mr chamberlain was colonial secretary a period of transition of imperial transition to which mr chamberlain led the way nobody has ever forgotten his adjuration to all englishmen to think imperially as i remember canada during several visits she was at that time more inclined to think independently not that any party in the dominion meditated a secession from the empire but there was a pretty distinct notion and claim of colonial autonomy canada came first as canada and not as a part of the empire the moment when imperial considerations first became dominant in the canadian mind was a moment of the boer war there it is that lord mento's name becomes indissolubly allied with the dominion his share in that great transaction of the canadian contingent to south africa has never i think been fully understood by the british public nor could it ever be if the matter were left to him he was never a man to advertise himself or his deeds i dare say he will not like my telling the story though i shall tell it only as it was told to me and the teller had nothing to do with government house it was for a while doubtful whether canada would send troops there was i am told an uncertain feeling about the militia organization then on a different footing from the present there were awkward stories of corruption and inefficiency 
It was doubted whether a force officered and equipped in conditions then existing would do credit to the Dominion. There were hesitations on other grounds. But when finally a levy was voted, Lord Minto, who had taken no part in the discussion and could take none, availed himself of his authority as governor-general and of his experience as a soldier and gave his personal attention to the organization of the contingent. It was stated to me much more strongly than that, and my informant seemed to doubt whether Lord Minto did not exceed, or at least strain, his prerogatives as representative of the Crown. If he did, so much the better. The English have ever liked a servant in high place who was not afraid of responsibilities. But for my purpose it is enough to say that Lord Minto took an active part in these momentous preparations. I think no officer was appointed without his sanction, no contract for supplies entered into which he did not approve, no arrangement of any kind made but upon his initiative or with his express consent. The result was that the Canadian forces reached Africa, a body of soldiers fit for the field, not as a mere aggregation of men, food for powder." England knows, and all the world knows, what service they did. There were no better troops of the kind, perhaps not many of any kind, better adapted for the work they had to do and for coping with such an enemy as the Boers. They did more than their contract called for in the field. They builded better than they knew. They made it plain to all men that the country which had sent such troops as these many thousands of miles beyond the seas to the relief of the imperial forces of great britain was itself an integral and indispensable part of the empire whereas if they had failed or only half succeeded they would have done little good to the british arms in south africa and none at all to the imperialism of which canada today is a bulwark and if this is a true account, as I believe it to be, of the way in which these two great results were brought about, the credit of them belongs more to Lord Mento than to any other man. I do not offer this as an explanation of the regard in which Lord Mento was held. It could not be an explanation, because it was not generally known. There were other reasons, at the top of which I should put his common sense, his sincerity, and, of course, that devotion to duty which every governor-general is presumed to possess, which in him was conspicuous. Everybody liked him, nobody doubted him. He made the interests of Canada his own. He traversed that vast territory from end to end again and again. He held a court not in Ottawa only, but in Quebec, in Halifax, in Toronto, and in that far north where Canada touches Alaska, and the chief harvest of the soil is gold. His five years' term came to an end, but the Colonial Office and Parliament House and the people of Canada wished him to stay on, and so the five years became six, a period on which to look back with pride. Canada is again fortunate in her Governor-General, and in his relations with those who mold public opinion on the American side of the border. I imagine it may not be known in England how he first conquered the respect and goodwill of the Americans. It was at a dinner of some five hundred or six hundred people at the Waldorf Hotel in New York. In the course of his short speech, Lord Grey referred, with a plainness unusual in those exalted regions, to what had been said in times past about the possible absorption of Canada by the United States. But now, observed the Governor-General, there is no more reason for discussing the annexation of Canada by the United States than for discussing the annexation of the United States by Canada. It was a straight hit from the shoulder, but the audience rose to it and cheered him as I had heard no Englishman cheered in New York before that time. He became, in a moment, a great figure, filling the public eye. He delivered his tremendous sentence with simplicity and good humor. There was nothing like defiance or menace. Everybody saw that he felt himself on a level with his hearers. He spoke as Governor-General of the Dominion to the people of the United States. De gal a egal. He spoke as an Englishman to Americans. 
Mr. Price Collier may say, if he chooses, that English and Americans do not like each other, but I will ask him what other two nationalities have the same, or anything like the same, points of contact and of sympathy. There stood Lord Grey, just an Englishman, holding out his hand to his American cousins. If the hand happened for that moment to be clenched, it was none the less a greeting, and was understood as such. You could not look into his face without seeing in it the spirit of kinship and of friendship. Lord Grey is preeminently one of those men who think the best relations between men or between communities must spring from frankness. He wanted to clear the ground, and he did clear it. If he had asked anybody's advice, he would certainly have been advised not to say what he did. He preferred to trust to his own instincts, and they proved to be true instincts. The danger was that a freedom of speech which would be accepted from his lips might be resented when read in cold print, but it was not. No American will have forgotten Lord Grey's gift of his portrait of Franklin to Philadelphia. That endeared him to us still further. It was a prize of war which he surrendered, taken in the War of the Revolution by General Sir Charles Grey. It used to hang near the ceiling in one of the reception rooms of Hoek House, Northumberland. I saw it there some time before the gift, and Lord Grey told me its history, but did not tell me he meant to give it back to America. I believe he did ask whether I thought Philadelphia would care to have it again, a question to which I could not but say yes. Yet it might also be thought of the family with a good deal more than a hundred years of possession behind it. But in this country a hundred years do not count so much as elsewhere. The English have long since got into the habit of reckoning by centuries. When Lord Grey went to Washington, the President asked me to bring him to the White House. Mrs. Roosevelt had a reception that evening, and I said, with her permission, I would bring him then. Very good, said the President, and mind you bring him to me as soon as you come. I did as I was told. The President greeted him, as he did everybody, warmly, but in a way that made Lord Grey understand he was welcome. Within thirty seconds they were deep in political economy, a matter of which Lord Grey had made a profounder study than the President. For the Englishman had not, like Bacon and Mr. Roosevelt, taken all knowledge to be his province, and was able to master his subject. More than once I had occasion to see something of his familiarity with difficult subjects, once at dinner when the late Mr. Bight, the South African magnate, sat on his right, and the two discussed financial and political questions. Mr. Bight had made a great fortune in South Africa, and Lord Grey had not. The chartered company had not then proved a mine of wealth to its administrator, but the minds of the two were at one. The knowledge of each was immense. The power of grappling with great subjects was common to both. Perhaps Lord Grey sometimes took an imaginative view, but the feet of the capitalist were planted in the solid earth. The President and the Governor-General became friends at once, neither of the two being the kind of man to whom friendship requires length of years to come into being. It is, of course, for the interests of both Canada and the United States that relations of sympathetic goodwill should exist between the rulers of each. A few hours before their meeting, the President knew nothing about Lord Grey. Even to Mr. Roosevelt's omniscience, there are limits. But he desired to know, and when he had heard a little of Lord Grey's history, said joyfully, All right, we have subjects in common and ideas, too so the doors of the White House opened wide to the Governor-General, and Lord Grey was the President's guest, and the impression in Canada was a good impression. End of chapter 30